hit the record button. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, Dan, you can show your screen. George, how do I, how do I minimize the right-hand side? Just click on the orange button. The orange button. Okay. And um, I clicked from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Show your screen. I'm not sure. The screen does not appear? No. When you say show my screen, are, are you not seeing Welcome to Green, the Green no. Hotel webinar series? No. Oh, boy. Um, How do I do it? I'm going to do it, and you just tell me to switch. Okay. George, are we ready? Hold on one second. Start. Oh, great. Can you see my screen? Uh, OK. okay. And every, uh, George, could people see this screen? Welcome to the Green Hotel webinar series. George, could everybody see this? George, could everybody see Welcome to Green Hotel webinar series? We see today's webinar presentations. George, what yeah, do you it's need on. To do? Go ahead, start it. It's on. Slide, but we do see your presentation. Okay. Does everybody, George? Does everybody see? Welcome to Green Hotel Webinar Series. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Start your okay. presentation. Welcome everybody to the Green Hotel Webinar Series. Sorry for this confusion at the beginning. Could you hear me, George? Yes. George, is that, can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Green Hotel webinar series. <clears throat> My name is Dan Rubin. I'm the executive director of Boston Green Tourism. We are an organization of 30-some greater Boston hotels going green. I also organize workshops and webinars like this one around the country, and I consult with hotels on going green around the country. Um, the objectives of this series are to help hotels reduce energy, water, waste, and toxins. And in doing so, it will help hotels achieve green certification or help you market your hotel as a green hotel in other ways. This is the third of six webinars. Um, if you haven't registered for the others, please do. Uh, also, as a part of this Environmental Protection Agency grant, I'm giving uh, uh, training sessions for up to 10 hotels or hotel groups. If you're interested in one, please contact me. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Um, the uh, Steve DeBus is going to talk about window fill how it benefits hotels and new talk is going to talk about toxic use reduction for hotels. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Two program notes. Send us your questions during the session. Uh, we should be able to get to some of them. If we can't 
get to all of them, we will get back to you individually uh, in, after the session. And um, these presentations will be posted. Uh, I'll notify everybody who registered for at least one event once they're posted. The PowerPoints will be posted, and hopefully we'll be able to post the recordings too. Um, here's my contact information if, uh, if you need to reach me. Uh, George, please turn the controls over to Steve DeBusk. And uh, well, I introduce Steve. Steve DeBusk has 30 years of experience in the energy efficiency business. His primary focus for the past 19 years at Eastman Chemical has been working with energy service companies, energy management companies, consultants, and contractors in the development of energy efficiency project opportunities with energy saving window films. Many of the projects involve hotels around the world. Mr. DeBusk is a certified energy manager, a certified measurement and verification professional, and a certified de uh, sustainable development professional through the Association of Energy Engineers. Uh, Steve, please take it away. Okay. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to the EPA for uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar. And again, uh, my topic is window films. And just to give you a, a brief background, I know a lot of people have different ideas about window films. There's been a lot of advances in, in window films over the past several years. Uh, most notably, there's been advances in being able to develop lighter, less reflective films. They're called spectrally selective. And they have low reflectance and they're still able to keep out quite a bit of heat gain, uh, solar heat gain. And one of the other newer developments that I'm going to talk about more specifically today are low E films that in the past the window films have been kind of a summer only, cooling only type product. And now this development into low E films gives us a, a year round product that's able to help both in the summer and the winter. But regardless of the window film type, all, all window films have a transparent metallic coating or a nano uh, ceramic coating in the material. It's a polyester film. And the metallic coatings and the ceramic coatings, they actually help to you know, reflect or absorb solar heat before it has a chance to get into the building. And of course, that helps reduce cooling costs. And on the room side of the film, we have a durable, it's a scratch-resistant clear acrylic coating, so you can clean the windows with typical you know, window cleaners of just about any type. Uh, you just have to be careful not to use like you know scrapers or uh, things like that. Uh, just about all window films, you know, especially in a hotel, they are professionally installed by certified or authorized installers from different manufacturers. And because of that, most most uh, manufacturers have a training program that the installers have to go through. So with the, with the new advances in adhesives and the films that I've talked about and the certification programs. Uh, just about all manufacturers have warranties of 10 to 15 years on their products. Now, in hotels, the main reason people want to use film in a hotel typically is for guest comfort. You have rooms that are too hot. You have guests complaining. Uh, even people that work in the in the hotel complain about it being too hot. So that, that's the primary reason. Uh, you know, reduce the heat buildup in the summer. Reduce glare. Uh, film also has a UV protectant built into the film to protect the film, which in turn helps reduce UV uh, rays into the building, helps reduce fading of furniture and uh, you know, drapes and, and whatnot. Uh, another primary reason is to improve the overall appearance uh, of the hotel on the exterior, and I have an example of that. Uh, while all these things that I've mentioned already are nice, uh, typically you, you, you do need to have a return on investment. You, you do have to have a return on investment uh, to you know, get the financial part of the project to go through. And window films typically can save 5 to 10 percent in energy costs in a, in a hotel. And in most cases, that, would, that will provide a two to, uh, payback in about two to five years. And in most, uh, just about all the warm climates have prescriptive rebates for window films, like a, a dollar or two dollars per square foot. But uh, even in places that do not have prescriptive rebates, there's often customized uh, rebates where the, re the rebate's based on the kilowatt hour savings. And those rebates in general pay for about 15, 20, up to 50 percent of the uh, project cost. And I mentioned up front the primary reason people uh, want to use 
uh, window film in their, in their hotel is for guest comfort. And this is an uh, actual measurement that were taken from a hotel in, in Houston, the Hyatt Regency in Houston. And I know there's a, a few people from the Hyatt Regency in, in other cities on the call. But, uh, and I have more about that specific case study in just a little bit. But here we can see in the, in the daytime, you can see the nighttime temperatures, all the temperatures are about the same. But in the middle of the day, the green line represents some windows in six different rooms where there was no film, and then the blue lines represent where there was window film installed. And you can see there's differences of about 25 to 30, as much as 40 degrees difference near the window. So obviously, it's the film's helping to reduce solar heat gain into the room, helping to make people more comfortable. Now, the two types of film I'm going to talk about the most today are solar control films and low E films. And uh, there's some other films I'll mention as well. The solar control film, again, they're the, the cooling only, help reduce solar heat gain in the summer. And typical costs are about 5 to $7 per square foot of glass. And they can be applied to all the different exposures on a hotel, just typically to make the uniform, the appearance look uniform. Uh, sometimes people don't choose to put film on the north, uh, or they just choose to put film on like a west side or a south side where they get the most solar heat gain. But it just varies depending on the location. Uh, the low E films that I mentioned, uh, they're a little bit more expensive because they do have added benefits of helping to reduce uh, heat loss in the winter. And uh, typically they are applied to all sides because even on the north side they're helping reduce heat loss at night and during the day. There's also some safety and security films for locations that are, uh, you know, hotels that are located in, say, wind, wind uh, areas or uh, locations that are subject to hurricanes. Uh, help keep, keep broken glass together, keep the glass in the window so you don't have wind and rain blowing into the hotel. There's anti-graffiti films. If you have problems with graffiti in restrooms or on elevators or on, uh, on, on windows on the outside of the building, it's a clear protective film that when the graffiti goes on, it's actually going onto the film, and then you can re have the installation company come back and remove that marked up film and just put up clear film so everything looks nice. And there's also decorative films that give, uh, give glass the, you know, you can have different patterns in the glass. Typically it's a frosted glass, just looks like frosted glass. But we can actually uh, put different types of, uh, different types of diagrams or uh, pictures in, actually into the glass to make it look decorative. I have a few case studies I'd like to go over. The first was a project in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where the, the hotel was having a lot of trouble keeping the rooms to a, you know, relatively comfortable in the summer. The rooms were like 78 to 80 degrees, having a lot of complaints. And they looked at some window film op options, and the window film they came up with helped keep the rooms more comfortable. There's almost no, uh, you know, guest complaints now from the rooms being too hot. The window film itself for this particular hotel, you can see a picture of how large the hotel is on the right. It's kind of a, a medium-sized hotel. It was about $75,000. And that provided a return on investment in about three years. And you can also see on the bottom pictures how the window film helps people see out better in, during the day and at night as well. It helps reduce the glare. A uh, second project was this hotel, the Hyatt Regency in Los Angeles, where they were having sort of the same problems. People were having. Uh, the guest rooms were having trouble keeping up with the air conditioning load. So uh, the two options they had were to improve the HVAC system or to uh, install uh, window film. Uh, the HVAC system upgrade was well over a million dollars. I don't have the specifics on this uh, hotel project for the window film, but just looking at the size of the building, it was probably in the neighborhood of you know, 100 to $150,000. So, uh, looking at uh, the type of glass that they had before on this hotel and knowing that they had a lot of heat and glare, typically in, in California with the with climate and the utility rates there, they probably had a you know, payback in less than three or four years. And this is the Adams Park Hotel in Dallas. It's uh, actually a Sheraton Hotel now. And then we're looking at, this was actually uh, a picture of the hotel before film was installed. They were looking at updating the appearance of the hotel updating the windows, the high-performance windows. I'm sorry if this keeps coming up on the screen here, this Windows update. I don't know what that's all about. 
uh, uh, but they needed to replace the windows, which could have been as much as five to seven million dollars. And they opted to look at uh, a window film that actually was able to do what the uh, replacement windows were would have, would have been doing for about you know one fifth to one seventh of the cost. And the window film that was installed uh, actually rejects 78 percent of the solar heat. And you can see this actually provided a payback in about two years. So there was a very large utility rebate also offered on this of about $200,000. And this, this is a very large project, to be honest. I mean, most, most window film projects for hotels are in the $50,000 to $250,000 range. Now, I've talked about energy savings uh, in some of the slides, and most of the manufacturers do provide a Department of Energy DOE2 or Energy Plus program analysis of your hotel to tell you how much you know how much your energy savings are going to be, the kilowatt hour savings, possibly the therm or heating savings if you're using a uh, heating fuel, and give you the return on investment. And these energy audits are also typically used by the, the local utilities. As I mentioned before, a lot of customized rebates depend on these energy projections to you know, give you the kilowatt hour and the therm savings that they use for the rebate. And for those of you that are doing green certification of any type or LEED certification, you, you can see here there's uh, several different ways that window films can help provide LEED certification points towards, towards actual certification. So I'm not going to go through all those, but uh, you know, primarily the, the two most important are energy savings and improving uh, guest or occupant comfort. Now one of the developments I talked about was our low E films. And again, they're similar to the, the solar control only films that I talked about. You know, they keep out the heat in the summer, help reduce you know, glare, improve comfort. Uh, also help reduce fading. Uh, but they help retain radiant heat in the winter. So all objects in the room are trying to radiate heat to the outdoors. And the low heat coating on these films helps keep that heat in the building, helps reduce heating costs. And I don't have a picture of this actually on a, uh, a hotel. This is uh, some infrared photography we took at a, a house in Maryland recently. And you can see the actual uh, picture on the left and an infrared picture on the right. And you can see the infrared image to the most on, on the right of the of the person standing there, his face is red, his, his shirt's kind of blue, his arms are red, and you can see his reflection in the window as the, the this low E film is reflecting that radiant heat back into the room almost at 100 percent. So again, it's going to help reduce you know the loss of heat to the outdoors, and that's actually shown in this next slide where we have. It's shown in the next slide here where the, uh, the window in this infrared image, the window on the left has this low E film applied to it. And you can see that window is, is uh, much cooler temperatures. The window to the right is a dual pane unit just like the window on the left, but it does not have the low E film applied to it. It's a much redder, much warmer uh, temperature. So the heat in the house is actually escaping into the glass and causing the glass to get warmer, and then that heat's lost to the outdoors for the window without low E film. And then again, the window to the left with the low E film much cooler, so the heat's being retained in the house. You know, the same uh, the same would apply to a hotel as well. And actually, the performance of this low E film, when it's applied to single pane glass, actually upgrades the performance of the, of the window to that of what dual pane windows have. And similarly, if you have dual pane windows, it can upgrade the insulating performance to that of triple pane glass. And this, this is a, uh, the next few slides in the, toward the end here. Uh, the next few slides are a case study we did on the Hyatt Regency in Houston, uh, where when this low E film was installed in July of 2012. Uh, there's about 20, 25,000 square feet of glass involved in this project. Uh, they opted only to put film. This is kind of a triangular shaped building. So there's film that was installed on the southwest and the southeast parts of the building, but not on the northeast. And the Hyatt actually had a contract with an energy efficiency company from Maryland called Green Generation Solutions. 
and Green Generation Solutions evaluated different types of films and chose the low E film, even though there's not a huge need for heating in Houston. It acted, the low E film provided better cooling savings in the summer and was able to offer some heating savings as well. And working with uh, Green Generation Solutions on this project, what we were able to do is uh, there was 48 rooms and all the rooms had the same heat pump. So the individual heat pump in each room. So there was 48 rooms with film as a test and 48 rooms without film as part of a test for six months. And Green Generation Solutions was able to monitor the uh, energy usage over the cooling season and the heating season. And they came up with an actual measured savings of 23% savings on cooling and 25% savings on heating, which you can see on the slide provided annual savings of about $32,000 a nice return on investment and the utility, yeah. the utility used this for their rebate as well. And I have a couple of infrared pictures and some, uh, some graphs of this case study. So you can see the hotel room on the left, what it looks like. Uh, the infrared image at the top are the windows as they exist or the, the way the windows existed before the uh, low E film was installed. So you can see the windows get really hot they radiate most of that heat into the room. So they're, they're helping to block some of the heat and some of the glare, but they're not doing a very good job of that. The window to the right, or I'm sorry, on the bottom, that has the blue appearance, has the film applied over it, uh, the low E film. And it, it is, you know, the, the low E film does absorb heat, and the window is fairly warm, just like the window at the top, but it's not radiating that heat into the room. So it helps reduce the solar heat gain uh, again, as much as this particular film blocked about 76% of the solar heat gain. And here, here's the actual graph of the uh, usage in the uh, 48 rooms with film versus 48 rooms without. The green line is the rooms without film, and the blue line is the rooms that had film applied to it. And you can see this was actually over, this was about a one-month period. And during this one month, the savings were about 22% on the uh, electricity usage in those rooms. And as far as winter performance, this was uh, December, uh, end of December to the first part, first half, half of January. And again, the unfilled rooms, you can see at the top, had a higher energy usage, and the rooms with film, a much lower usage. This, in this particular period, the savings were about 28%, but over all of the heating period during the test, it was a 25% a savings on heating. And the last slide here, just, just to let you know, uh, when window film is installed, it does require the film, the film is installed with a basically a soapy water solution, and so it takes about seven days, typically seven days to 14 days, is possibly as much as, much as a month for that some of the water that's left behind to evaporate through the film and for the film to have a you know perfectly clear appearance. And before people can actually clean the windows, that film needs to you know get that clear uh, appearance so that the films adhere to the glass really well. And just to, I've already mentioned before, you, you really cannot use abrasive window cleaners. You can use, like the, the picture here, you can use you know glass cleaners like Windex or soapy water or uh, most other alcohol-based solutions for cleaning windows with squeegees or, or you know, soft cloths or, or paper towels. You just can't use like razor scrapers or you try to remove things off the glass or anything that might scratch the glass. And again, most window films carry a 10 to 15 year warranty, so you know, it's fully expected the films will be uh, up and looking good for 10 to 20 years uh, as uh, based on that. And just to let you know, the most window film manufacturers do carry on the, on the warranty. It's a film plus labor uh, warranty. So if for any reason the film you know, uh, does need to be replaced under warranty, it, there's no cost to the, the hotel for film or labor. And that is all the slides. Steve, do you have a, a last slide with your contact information? Oh, Don't you have one more slide? There you go. There you are. Um, we have time for uh, a quick question. And uh, two quick questions. Steve, in the beginning of your presentation, you cited a two to five year payback for window film. Is that payback time frame based on the straight cost, or is it that 
the payback period is uh, includes the rebates. Well, it would typically include rebates. To be, uh, yeah, I didn't mention that, but uh, you know, not you know, to be honest, not every hotel in the world is going to have a two to five year payback. So it depends on factors, you know, such as if, if the windows have large overhangs that shade the glass all the time. Those those are probably not really good opportunities for return on investment, but they may have other opportunities for you know, reducing glare or fading or improving comfort. But you know, most hotels do have a lot of glass, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 percent window to wall ratio. So that's that's why most hotels do have a pretty good return on uh, window film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What what causes the wide range of the cure rate, seven to 30 days? Uh, this just depends a lot on specifically when when the film is installed. Uh, obviously, if it's installed in the middle of the summer, I mean, it, it can be cured in two or three days. You know, if it's in a colder location and people are installing film, say in you know, October or November, and it's you know, east-facing glass that doesn't get a lot of sun or you know, possibly mm. facing glass with the low E film, it may take as much as 30 days for the window film to cure and, and uh, get its full bond to the glass. It, it has a really good bond initially, you know, immediately, but it just takes that period for the bond to actually, you know, be completed. Okay, and lastly, very quickly, does this window film always change the exterior look of the building? No, as I, as I mentioned, there are some newer spectrally selective films that typically are very, very light films. They're 60%, uh, 70% visible light transmission. I think there's some that are even 80% light transmission. And just to reference, single pane clear glass is 90% light transmission. And so they they can block 40 to 50 percent of the heat, and they also don't really have much of a reflectance on the outside. They have the same reflectance as glass. Okay. But well, to be honest, some, sometimes it is necessary to use a little bit higher performance films that they have a little bit of reflectance or maybe some reflectance to help keep more of the heat gain out if you have severe problems with you know too much heat or too much glare. Okay, thank you, Steve. George, let's turn the controls over to Peter Gorin, uh, who is going to talk about stormwater management. Peter Gorin is the president and founder of the American Green Lodging and Hospitality Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating the hospitality industry about sustainability initiatives. Formerly, he directed the Florida Green Lodging Program, a state initiative that he helped establish. Peter has extensive experience in various areas of environmental protection and sustainability. Peter, take it away. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Very good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit this afternoon about uh, stormwater management for the hospitality industry. If you're interested in learning more about me or our organization, uh, please feel free to go to the website listed at the end of our presentation. You know, unlike initiatives to reduce energy and water consumption, the payback for managing your stormwater may not be as obvious. My goal here today is to convince you how important it is for hotel properties to pay greater attention to both stormwater generated by their property and the management of their stormwater management system. So let's start off talking about what stormwater is, what it is not, and why a hotel needs to manage it. Very simply, storm water is water from rainfall or a snow melt event that flows over the land or an impervious surface and does not get absorbed by the ground. What is not storm water is water generated by washing dirt or oils, lawn chemicals or grass clippings off the street and into a storm drain. And it's not water generated by washing or steam cleaning equipment like PTAC units in the back parking lot, regardless of whether you're using chemicals or not. It's not water generated from washing or disposing of any items into the storm drain, such as paints or washing of paintbrushes. And it's certainly not uh, mop water that's poured out in the back parking lot or directly into a storm water drain. Not even water that's generated from washing uh, vehicles is considered stormwater. 
So with that in mind, again, what needs to go into the storm drain? Only stormwater. And again, stormwater is generated from rainfall or snowmelt events only, and only it should go into a storm drain. Well, now that we've talked a little bit about what stormwater is and what it is not, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why it's important to manage it. So when rainfall or snow melt becomes stormwater, it either gets absorbed into the ground where it filters and replenishes the aquifer, or it flows into creeks, streams, rivers, ultimately making its way down to estuaries and the ocean. However, in urbanized areas, impervious surfaces such as rooftops, roads, and parking lots prevent stormwater from naturally percolating into the ground. Instead, the water runs rapidly across surfaces and into storm drains, sewer systems, and drainage ditches, causing an increase in volume and velocity of stormwater and sediments, which can be destructive to both public and private property and infrastructures. Stormwater also continue, or, I'm sorry, stormwater also contributes to the conveyance of urban pollutants to our lands and waters. These pollutants include oils, greases, and toxic chemicals from motor vehicles, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and fertilizers from lawns and gardens, viruses, bacteria, and nutrients from pet wastes and failing septic systems, road salts, and heavy metals from roof shingles, motor vehicles, and other sources. And it all ends up somewhere downstream where it can have devastating impacts on the environment. So downstream, remember, unmanaged stormwater results in siltation of fish and wildlife nurseries and the pollution of their habitat, which in turn affects food supplies and recreational hunting and fishing. Hoteliers spend a great deal of time and money each year to maintain a clean and attractive setting for their guests. Properly managing a stormwater system pre prevents the unsightly accumulation of dirt and trash at and surrounding a property and can prevent the, re the release of unpleasant odors from a sewer system. Now by itself, flooding of a hotel can be a devastating event to both the staff and the owners. But the effects of mold caused by high moisture levels can have an even long-term effect on the uh, property for, for many years to come. So managing a hotel stormwater system can prevent both flooding and erosion. It can also prevent the decay and destruction of a property's landscape caused by excess siltation and soil moisture. And managing stormwater can lessen the need to use landscape fungicides when soil moisture contents remain high for long periods of time. Now many states and local governments have a number of guidelines, ordinances, and requirements for managing a facility stormwater system for the purposes of preventing, reducing, and or treating stormwater runoff. It's important that every property check with their local stormwater management group to learn more about what these requirements are and to ensure that they are in compliance with them. Now there's a potential to reduce losses in money and save money on each of the issues just mentioned. Now many of you are with vacation or resort properties, which may attract guests because of the area's outdoor recreational opportunities or its natural beauty. Obviously, it's doubly important for these properties to do everything they can to maintain what attracts their guests. The active management of a property stormwater system can help ensure the health and beauty of both a property and the neighboring community where their guests visit. Losses can be prevented and money saved by properly managing a stormwater system to reduce flooding and erosion. And finally, knowing what is required of a hotel for the proper management of their stormwater system can certainly prevent any regulatory fines from being levied against it, saving time and money. So at this point, I hope I've convinced um, all of you how important it is to actively manage your property's stormwater and stormwater system. So let's discuss what you can do about managing 
uh, your stormwater at your property. So a hotel is not unlike a factory. It consumes energy, water, materials, and goods, and hopefully generates products, services, and employment. What else does it produce? Waste products. Things like solid and hazardous waste, wastewater, and of course, stormwater. Every structure, every building, every hotel produces stormwater. So here are some um, operational best management practices to help a hotel better manage their stormwater. First, you want to work with your locally available resources, such as your county or city stormwater management program. Talk to your, your local universities. Find out who your agricultural extension agent is and ask for free assistance to help you develop a stormwater management plan. Or consider hiring a professional stormwater management consultant to develop your plan and help you to implement it. Second, educate your staff about the importance of managing your property stormwater and work closely with them to implement the plan. If you, if you contract with a lawn service or with any other contractor for work on your property, check with them to make sure that nothing but stormwater makes its way into the stormwater system. Better yet, consider adding specific prohibitions to any contracts established. Your list should include a prohibition on the disposal of the following items into the stormwater system. Obviously, solid waste such as street sweepings, dirt, and grass clippings. Toxins or nutrients used for landscape maintenance. Cleaning products such as degreasers or bleaches, even if they're non-toxic. Paints, oils, greases, including low or no VOC products, and cooking oils. And of course, a prohibition on all wash water should be added including even, wash, even water generated when washing the outside of a building or the parking lot. Make sure that staff keep all stormwater drains and catch basins clear of silt, leaf litter, and trash, and that all wastes be properly disposed of in the property solid waste disposal system, like a dumpster or compactor. Staff should actively look to control and properly remove all oils and greases from the parking lot dumpster or cooking oil collection station if it's located outside. If any washing must be done, any pressure washing, any steam cleaning, be sure it's done on a flat or porous surface such as a lawn or porous concrete with non-toxic cleaners. If possible, use a mop sink shown here on the right to wash small equipment and other items such as paintbrushes and mops. Even PTAC units can be easily cleaned in these wash basins if they're big enough. Now let's talk a little bit about the many uh, infrastructure best management practices that are available. There are dozens of structural features or modifications that can be made to a property and its stormwater management system to optimize water quality and reduce volume. This includes, but's not, but are not limited to, projects such as land contouring. This is one of the most common BMPs utilized to slow the conveyance of water. It can be as simple as sloping land away from a building to prevent undermining of the structure's foundation to constructing a stormwater retention basin. In a retention basin, water slowly makes its way through vegetation and percolates through the soil for filtration and biological action to remove pollutants. As can be seen here, they can be both functional and attractive to both people and wildlife. Concrete, uh, concrete grid pavers can be employed to reduce runoff volumes and trap vehicle generated pollutants, and they can be used in both low and high traffic areas. Vegetative filter strips, when properly designed, can reduce sediment and remove pollutants from stormwater before it makes its way into the stormwater system and natural water bodies downstream. And grassy swales can provide filtration and pea treatment to water before it gets discharged into the treatment system or even into a receiving water body. Rain barrels and cisterns. Well, they've been around for pretty much as long as civilization itself. 
Even though their primary use is to harvest rainwater, they're also an excellent tool to help control and treat volumes of stormwater generated in a rainfall event. And last but not least, green roofs are becoming exceedingly popular, particularly with those properties seeking LEED certification. They can serve several purposes for a hotel, such as to absorb and filter rainwater and to provide insulation to the building. It can also provide a more aesthetically pleasing view from guest rooms that overlook them. All right, so if you're interested in learning more about stormwater, why it's important to manage, and what a hotel can do to better improve it, I recommend you visit these sites. And of course, there's lots of sites out there. I, I found that these are all excellent sites right here. Just Google these locations and you'll get right to those URLs. And with that, I am complete. Uh, if anybody has any questions uh, after uh, this webinar, please feel free to contact me. And, uh, or if you just want to talk about uh, our organization or, or management of stormwater. Thank you very much. Peter, we did, we did have one question sure. from the audience that, I, that I'd like to give you. And that is, um, we wanted to, uh, this person wanted to make sure that uh, the need for maintenance of stormwater best management practices uh, occurs, that there are great projects uh, that, that uh, sometimes facilities do great projects, but they fail to do the maintenance. Is there something you could say about that? Well, yes. Uh, obviously, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, working with your staff to make sure that the, that the storm drains remain clean and the catch basins, uh, that all that silt is taken out there on a regular basis, obviously, maintenance is very important. That's why you have a stormwater management plan, and that's why you make sure that that plan is implemented. Um, but the, the more difficult part, I think, is, is your contractors. I've been to uh, many hotels uh, during assessments and seen things that you, you just couldn't believe. I've seen, I've seen uh, where painters at a certain resort in Florida, we won't mention the name of that resort, was uh, washing their brushes out in the storm drain. And right on top of the storm drain, it said, it said no dumping. Just amazing. And the problem there was a language problem. It was only in English. Um, and so ah. the, the, yeah. So they were washing their brush out there. And when I pointed it out to the person I was with, they obviously um, stopped them immediately. They knew that it was wrong. But the, but the contractor did not. I've seen where uh, people were, uh, after they applied lawn fertilizer, you know, a little bit of that lawn fertilizer gets on the, on the street or the sidewalk. And they're out there with a hose or with a with a blower blowing it off into the street and down into the storm gutter. So it's it's controlling your contractors that's so difficult. Not not so much controlling your staff. Hopefully. Okay. Another question: um, Is there a trend amongst municipalities to enact ordinances that prevent the installation of cisterns to collect runoff? Um. I think the trend's going the other way, uh, actually. I think the local governments are becoming more enlightened about uh, how important it is, particularly with, particularly in areas where we're having droughts out in California and the south and in, in, you know, in the southeast. Uh, I think, although we're not having a drought right now, but in general, um, I think um, the trend is to, to allow those cisterns and to implement uh, gray water systems for flushing toilets. Um, and uh, and things like that. So no, I think that the trend is is that you know again that governments are becoming more enlightened about the need for cisterns. Oh, good. I'll just add a comment uh, from Marcus Rivas of EPA Region Seven. Uh, one maintenance piece that's consistently failed are the living systems, so bioswales, roofs, etc. Uh, they need care, not just uh, not just plant them and ignore them. Um, the uh, just as with farmers, the best fertilizer is the farmer's feet. The facility manager needs to keep an eye on the biologic projects. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Well, thanks, Peter. That's really interesting and important. Um, George, let's turn the controls over to Peter Cook, and uh, I'll introduce Peter. Um, Peter Cook works for the Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences. During the past 15 years, he has worked with dozens of industry sectors on pollution prevention and sustainability. 
Previously, Peter worked in the Commissioner's Office at the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and developed Maine's green lodging and restaurant programs, which have been adopted by many other states. He has consulted with hotels on a variety of environmental topics. Uh, Peter Cook, take it away. Okay, thanks, Dan. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. You can see my first slide, too? Yes. Okay, I'll take it away. <clears throat> Okay, thanks uh, for having me on. Thanks for the intro, Dan. I'm going to talk about reducing toxics at hotels because all lodging businesses and restaurants use chemicals. So I'll show a list you know, of a lot of different places that they are used, uh, and so you'll have the context of what I'm going to be talking about uh, for this presentation. But first, some back background info on why a presentation on toxics reduction. So why should you consider reducing toxic chemicals at your facility? Your insurance liability goes down as you reduce. The cost liability of cleanups also goes down. And if you can prevent accidents and spills and from having these, chem these chemicals accumulate on site, your, cost, your potential cost liability goes down. And your overall indoor air quality will go up. And then, of course, you can communicate this to employees and customers that shows that the business does care about these issues. So Dan gave me a good in intro. My name is Peter Cook. I'll be your host for this part of the session. Um, here's a little bit of info on me. I was on Green Lodging News. Uh, you can download this from the slide later on if you're interested in reading more. Uh, lodging and, and lodging facilities and restaurants restaurants do have a potential chemical interaction with the environment in a variety of ways. Uh, they can generate air emissions, either direct or indirect. Direct air emissions would be, examples would be uh, tailpipes from delivery trucks, for instance, or even customer miles driven, if you wanted to account for that, or if you had an airport shuttle where your heating system is going to direct, uh, is going to have emissions, chemical emissions, directly into the environment. Indirect emissions would be um, emissions associated with the generation of electricity, for instance. As Peter Gorin just uh, gave an excellent presentation on stormwater, there are a lot of different chemicals that drip off of cars onto parking lots and pesticides that can all get into the stormwater. And of course, there is a lot of waste generated from solid waste, food waste, recyclables. But in particular interest for this presentation is ha potential hazardous waste generated at a hotel and a special category of hazardous waste called universal waste, which I'll explain in a few moments. And all uh, lodging facilities and restaurants use resources. They use water, they use energy, and they do use chemicals as part of the business. So to give you some examples, Examples, uh, we have asphalt sealants that are used out in the parking lots, uh, starting from the outside, uh, pesticide usage, there are mercury vapor, uh, CFLs, we have laundry chemicals, pool chemicals, cooling tower chemicals, rug shampoos, cleaning chemicals, all of these chemicals represent chemicals that can either be hazardous uh, or toxic, and there are environmentally preferable options for each. But first, what does toxic mean? It can mean a lot of these things on this slide, uh, how it reacts to humans or the environment uh, in a variety of different ways. And well, here's an example of uh, some respiratory distress from an exposure potentially to some hazardous chemicals, the air tube constricting uh, from some sort of reaction, probably not too comfortable. and probably sometimes, unfortunately, fatal. Uh, but now for a list of the specific areas you should look at at your own facility after this webinar. Here are the first five that I, I'm going to spend a little time talking about. It's not the most comprehensive list, but it's pretty close. I mean, these are the most common places that you'll be using chemicals. So for cleaning, for cleaning the rooms, cleaning the kitchens, uh, disinfectants included. Also, there are laundry chemicals. There are lighting products uh, that I mentioned have mercury vapor, pest control, pesticides. Uh, but hotels, uh, hotels and restaurants also use a lot of paint, uh, carpet, uh, and floor products, swimming pool chemicals, of course. Um, electronics, such as computers, laptops, um, 
photocopy machines, fax machines, uh, those also have sometimes some hazardous metals which need to be disposed of properly. And, properly. and then there's also uh, parking lots. Now, these are the easy areas that you can basically inventory today or tomorrow, I mean basically immediately, and to begin start planning for making reductions. And the reasons why you want to do that, just to reiterate again, is that if you can protect your workers and your customers from potential liability from exposure. It will improve the indoor air quality. It costs a lot to fix if you have an issue, but it does cost very little to prevent it. And as I mentioned, it can lower your insurance liability, and it can actually attract sensitive and, uh, and customers and customers that are inclined to go to businesses that are, are engaged in this type of practice. Now, a little bit more on the potential liability. Well, there are there are a couple of issues. There are the environmental issues, which these these leaves are sort of an example of uh, when you're walking down the street and you see a leaf with some funny uh, brown holes in them. You might think, okay, maybe there was a caterpillar eating through this. But these leaves are actually examples of VOC damage. VOC stands for volatile organic compounds. Uh, they can contribute to ground level ozone, uh, which is a precursor to asthma and also a precursor to brown spots on leaves. But that's just an indication of, of VOC in the environment. Um, so the environmental issues here, but then the cost liability that I really want to transition to is the responsibility that businesses have for the chemicals that they use and dispose of from the time they get them to all the way past their disposal if they happen to be hazardous. Uh, and this cost liability, which I'll illustrate in the next few slides, can be up to $50,000 per incident. So uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm from Maine, and Maine is a state with about one million people. So for whatever state all of you listeners are out there from, you can use the one million as a potential extrapolation. But for the last uh, 20 years, from about 1993 till 2013, there was almost 10,000 workers' compensation cases in the state of Maine, uh, which is about 450 cases a year. It cost $23 million. Uh, the, the costs associated with these exposure incidents, with the average cost being about $2,000. Um, so you might be saying, so what exactly are these costs? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a list of the costs just to have, so you have some context that it does actually cost something. I mean, in 2,000 cases since 1993 that actually did cost something, the average cost is about $18,000. Many, many, many cases of incidents of exposure go unreported or cost nothing. You know, somebody might just squirt something in their eye or get something on their hand and they just take care of it and it's not like a lost day of work or anything like that. But for the cases that do cost something, uh, the average cost is about a little over 18000 and there's been 500 cases in the last 20 years where the cost was actually greater than 5,000. And of those case, of those 500 cases where the cost was greater than $5,000, the average cost was $50,000. So uh, you can use this info. It's, it's actually kind of hard to get this info from your own state or even nationally, but you can sort of use this as an extrapolation. It's actually even harder to get it now in the state of Maine. I tried to update this recently, and it actually took several phone calls. Uh, but this is just some sort of contextual background so you know that exposure to ha hazardous chemicals uh, can contribute to a cost on the business. Uh, and there's a lot we don't know about chemicals, which is probably why there are so many incidents of exposure. Less than 2% of all the chemicals that are commercially available have never been tested for safety. I know people are going to be wanting to know what the resource, uh, the citation is for that. So here are three different websites you can look up that same uh, figure. So what can you do? You should maybe potentially check the label. Um, well, not all cleaning chemicals have a label that tell you what the ingredients are. Uh, and if they did, sometimes you might need a PhD in chemistry to understand them. You can always default to the MSDS sheet, but the MSDS sheets don't tell you the full list of ingredients. Uh, they're mostly concerned about how to clean up if there's a spill and what some of the hazardous constituents might be. Third-party certifications are really a great way to make sure that you may have green chemicals there, green seal, eco logo. I have a couple slides coming up with a little bit more information on that. Sometimes some cleaning chemicals don't have a third-party certification. So for instance, the seventh generation cleaners there on the slide, they're not part of any third-party certification, but they do provide a list of the full ingredients with, of what's in their bottle. 
And uh, I sort of use that sometimes as an indicator that it is likely to be an environmentally preferable chemical if they are actually publishing the full list of chemicals. Many chemical companies don't put any listing of what the chemicals are. So I do go by if they if they are willing to to um, list what the chemicals are in that cleaner, that it may be an environmentally preferable cleaning chemical. So for this slide, you know, you, you probably really would need some sort of degree in chemistry to be able to determine uh, what all of these are. How many of these would you recognize, how many of these chemicals listed here would you recognize as being either harmful or hazardous or toxic? On all of these chemicals here are really the usual suspects that we're sort of on the lookout for when we're looking for green cleaning chemicals to not have. Um, this, I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm not going to read the slide for you. This slide will be available after the presentation, of course. But I want to talk about what some of the potential impacts of chemicals like these in traditional cleaning chemicals might be. So we'll look at indoor air quality, water quality, and human health. And we'll talk about these three areas of impact. So for indoor quality, we're really looking at we're looking at volatile organic compounds, as I mentioned, uh, VOCs. They produce ground-level ozone, which is a precursor to asthma. Uh, these all affect uh, the air quality at a business. A pool uh, using cl chlorine products will have trihalomethanes uh, present. Usually about between uh, 0 and 12 inches above the water is where the highest concentration is, which is right where your head is when you're breathing, when you're swimming. Another thing that lodging businesses can do is uh, work with the place if they have a vendor that they use for dry cleaning to go to a wet cleaning model instead of using the perchloroethylene, which is carcinogenic and actually can stay on the clothes and off gas into a room. And also with regard to indoor air quality, anytime a, a bulb is broken, the mercury vapor escapes and that can be uh, quite, quite a toxic incident. So we want to be very careful with how we handle CFL bulbs, making sure that they don't break. And I can talk about that in a minute. The second topic was the water quality and the aquatic life. So for the chemicals that get out and eventually enter the water bodies, what do these chemicals do once they are out? And they can damage the hormonal systems of the natural life. They can spark algae blooms that can use up the oxygen uh, if they do get away from the business, enter into the storm drain and eventually get into the uh, natural water bodies. And then that third topic was the human health implication, short and long term uh, effects of suspected neurotoxins, carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, etc. Or, or just plain old chemicals that just burn when you get them on your skin. Uh, all these chemicals can either have both short and or long-term effects on us. So when you're looking at cleaning chemicals, um, you might be thinking about disinfecting. So can you get a green disinfectant? Well, disinfectants are essentially designed to kill things. So it would be really hard to get an environmentally preferable chemical that also kills things. Um, there are greener alternatives, perhaps uh, silver ionization or salt solution, even grapefruits, grapefruit seed extract is known uh, to disinfect. But really, if you're operating a business, you're going to be needing to use a traditional disinfectant, which is known to, to kill stuff on contact. The best, way to, uh, the, get the best way to reduce the amount of toxicity of a disinfectant is really to try to manage the amount that you are using uh, through specific operating practices. Um, So how do you, okay, I think I'm going to slide back there. Sorry about that. Um, when you disinfect, uh, there are specific parameters that you need to use. Typically, you need to clean the surface before you disinfect it, just to bring that kill time in. And then after it's cleaned, is then, then is when you hit it with a disinfectant. And that's pretty much the protocol for how to disinfect anything. Um, some companies come out with combo cleaner disinfectant. Uh, all in one. Now this type of product is used a lot because it's the same chemical, so you can clean stuff with it and you can disinfect with it. Unfortunately, to disin you have to do it twice because you still need to clean a surface before you disinfect it. 
Uh, but what you're going to be doing with this type of chemical is you're really going to be spreading a really harsh chemical around in a lot of areas that it doesn't need to be. When you could be using a green, a greener chemical to just do the cleaning of the surfaces that, that need to clean and then only disinfect the specific things that need to be disinfected. So for instance, the touch points. Uh, you know, places where people put their hands, uh, or cutting boards, uh, or knives, for instance. Uh, but really having a, met a methodological approach to what gets disinfected, so you're not essentially disinfecting everything. Uh, like a floor, for instance, does not need to be disinfected every day. I mean, maybe if there was some sort of an event where some bodily fluid is on the floor, then it could be disinfected. But floors and walls don't typically need to be disinfected as much as they need to be cleaned. So just having a, a good standard operating procedure about what gets disinfected and why, rather than spreading that chemical around uh, you know, on, on as many surfaces as possible is a good way to reduce it. The legal liability about using disinfectants is one that I've found. I've done, I've done uh, a lot of assessments at, at hotels and restaurants and other businesses that do a lot of cleaning. And all disinfectants are registered with the EPA as a pesticide because that's what they do. They kill germs and bugs. And every single disinfectant that is registered with the EPA has a personal protective equipment requirement, so that is PPE requirement, listed on the label of the product. And with any disinfectant, goggles and gloves are almost essentially always required when using disinfectants and sanitizers. You're going to need to look at the label of the disinfectant that you're using to find out if you're in conformance with this. And it always defers back to the label of the manufacturer. If there was ever an, an incident where somebody had a reaction from having a disinfectant on their skin or in their eye, it could be a potential legal liability. So here is an example of your typical disinfectant label. And I've taken red circles to show the one on the right shows the EPA registration number because Virtually every disinfectant that's known to be a disinfectant will have to have an EPA registration number. And then over on the left, it says wear goggles or face shield. Uh, I would say 99% of the lodging businesses and restaurants I've been to do the cleaning staff use goggles and face shields, or have they ever been told that they need to? So the legal liability there is um, is quite big. I think all uh, all a business would need to do is at least provide the goggles and the shields and have somebody sign off that they know that that is the requirement, so that way they can cover themselves if there ever is such an, an incident with an exposure uh, to a disinfectant. So dealing with disinfectants, one last time to minimize their use, develop a standard operating procedure for what gets disinfected versus what gets cleaned and disinfected. And you should specify these spots at your, your place of business and document the practices and document that your employees know that there is a PPE requirement when using disinfectants. Now, speaking of cleaning chemicals, there was an incident last year that Walmart had to, had to settle out uh, for an issue with an exposure to cleaning, to um, concentrated cleaning chemicals last year. Uh, and there was also another unrelated uh, case last year with Walmart involving throwing pesticides out in the trash, which as a business you can't do because that's disposal of a hazardous waste. But sliding over to the uh, less hazardous side on the hazardous waste is the universal category of hazardous waste, which is the mercury bulbs uh, area. And a number of the hotels that I've been to typically find broken bulbs, which release mercury vapor. So when you you know, the, I think the studies have shown that uh, mercury vapor at four nanoparticles per cubic meter is considered unhealthy. Anytime you see a bulb, like in this picture on the top left, where it's broken, it goes to 4,000 nanoparticles per cubic meter, uh, which is extremely unhealthy, and it persists over time and does not evaporate quickly. Really needs to be ventilated, but really these, this type of product really needs to be handled carefully. The box on the right shows a bunch of waste uh, fluorescent bulbs. I've been to a number of hotels where they do keep spent bulbs and burned out bulbs in a box, but I'll look in there and a lot of times they're broken in off gas mercury vapor right in the room where they're kept in the, in the maintenance closet, which is uh, it's not a great idea. But these bulbs, when they're spent and they're, and they're not broken, they need to be 
recycled and they can't be thrown in the trash and they can't be put into a green recycle bin and left on the street like in the sample down below. Uh, but they do need to be either taken by a vendor and, uh, and recycled where you should receive a manifest for that or you can self-transport it to a, tra to a transfer facility to ensure that they're being recycled. Also with universal waste, uh, the best practice is to slide them, uh, the spent ones back into the box that they came in to prevent them from falling over and breaking. And then right under this stairway here, that red sign says universal waste storage area. Uh, in virtually every state in the country, uh, universal waste needs to be in a, segrega in a segregated and locked storage area um, and labeled as such. Uh, so you can see I gave a, a sample label there as well. But this is underneath the staircase at a hotel where they're storing different kinds of waste, as well as the box on the far left standing upright where their bulbs are. Other types of uh, hazardous waste now, uh, Peter Gorin talked about in his stormwater presentation, include paints, uh, typically the oil-based paints, and, uh, and, and different types of solvents are typically uh, known to be hazardous when they are considered to be done, like if they're not going to be used anymore and they're going to be wasted, they should not be thrown out in the trash. Uh, these all need to go to the transfer station or disposed of as a hazardous waste through a hazardous waste hauler. Um, and that is the, the legal liability if you are a business, which I believe probably many of you on this webinar today are in business. So that is a business requirement. So we'll talk about a little bit about product substitution as I'm wrapping up here because there are many ways to substitute for some of these products that I've, I was talking about. Green, clean chemicals, you can always go with a green certification. Green seal, eco label, uh, or eco logo are three of the certifications that uh, I typically default to. With disinfectants, there is really no label that you can de default to, but as I mentioned, you develop a standard operating procedure to minimize its use. Uh, with laundry chemicals, you can look for uh, those that do not have nonphenol ethoxylates or NPE or phosphates. With lighting products, you could go to the uh, more efficient lighting that has not, that doesn't have any mercury in them. For instance, LED lighting, uh, light emitting diodes, uh, is the new style of lighting, and we've had some presentations on the previous webinars about lighting, and we'll have some more, I'm sure. Uh, those do not contain any toxic material inside, and they can be thrown in the trash uh, when they burn out. And with regard to pest control. Organic treatment, or IPM, uh, IPM stands for integrated pest management. So your pest contractor may be trained in integrated pest management where they think uh, think first and spray last. They try the, you know, less toxic alternatives before they finally resort to spraying. And then I think I was going to go, okay, with the paint, I forgot I have another couple slides here for this. We're looking at the low VOC or zero VOC content paint, and a lot of lodging businesses do a lot of painting. And with regard to carpet and floor products, uh, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, a lot of uh, in, a lot of institutional industrial style carpets have a PVC backing, which off gases polyvinyl chloride into the air for years. Uh, going with a non-PVC backed carpet uh, is the best practice. With the swimming pool, you have storage of hazardous chemicals, and there are alternative chemicals that can be used to help sanitize pools, all still, and all of which still need chlorine, basically by law, in every state. But there are things that you can do to reduce the amount of chlorine, whether it's adding an ionization unit to it, or adding an enzyme or an amino acid that helps the, the chlorine act more effectively, allowing you to use less chlorine. With electronics, uh, TVs, Computer monitors, computers, um, as I mentioned, those metals and those products are potentially hazardous uh, and can, you can um, go with less toxic electronics by looking for uh, EPEAT rated electronics uh, or Energy Star rated electronics. And with parking lots, you remember the slide earlier with the um, asphalt sealant, what we're looking for in the environmentally preferable uh, product area would be non-coal tar based asphalt sealants. Here's a, here's a sample of a successful pool project I was part of a couple of years ago in Maine at the YMCA that used an enzyme to help the chlorine act more effectively. Actually, the enzyme knocked the phosphates out of the water, or the phosphates in the water, just the natural occurring phosphates and the phosphates that people brought in from the, 
poo that was in their hair and on their bathing suits from the washing machine. Uh, basically, the phosphates were occupying the chlorine, and the chlorine had to work extra hard to sanitize the pool while dealing with the phosphates. The enzyme we used knocked the phosphates out. This YMCA, which has a huge beta load, was able to reduce the amount of chlorine they used uh, by 70% and also saved them a lot of money. Uh, they, they were saving over $3,000 a year. Here are a sample of the different logos that I was talking about. Green Seal Eco Logo, uh, Green Shield Certified is the is a certification for uh, for pest control companies, or Green Pro certified is another one. And there's a couple different uh, labels for either carpets or paint. Uh, the, the the Green Rug Initiative and the Green Guard Indoor Air Quality Certification are things to look be on the lookout for when you're purchasing products that might off gas in, into the indoor air. And then. Uh, Here's another slide on cleaning chemicals. So when you're going through your vendor, you may not have to change vendors. You may be able to ask your current vendor if they actually have a Green Seal certified line of cleaning chemicals or an Eco logo line or an Eco label line of cleaning chemicals. And then here's an example of the paint. So Green Guard paint or Green Seal also certifies paint. So we're looking for either zero VOCs or low VOCs. The VOCs are coming from the solvent that's in the paint that helps the paint dry faster. Uh, so if you don't have an, a huge need to have the paint dry super fast, you can go with the zero VOC and the low VOC paint, and it will greatly improve the indoor air quality of the room. And with carpet, uh, there are dry carpet cleaners rather than using liquid uh, carpet cleaners that will continually off-gas as well. These work. Uh, sometimes by static electricity or the net or the particles uh, just attach themselves and you sprinkle you can even um, I think there's even a, a vegetable based sort of uh, granule that you sprinkle on and you can then vacuum it up and then you don't have to wait for the carpet to dry to see how it looks because it is a dry cleaner then you can see how it looks we have some hotels in the state of Maine that are using this with great success and then lastly just to go back to the parking lot and this this is essentially my last couple slides here. Uh, the non-coal tar based asphalt seals, they just have a tremendous amount of impact either from runoff with stormwater or from people walking over the surface and then tracking it into their house. And with their the toxic that we're looking at here is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. So it is possible to get a non-coal tar based asphalt sealant. This is what some of the concerns are getting into the natural water bodies. Also, when you're at home and you're tracking this stuff into your house or into the hotel room and you have young kids crawling on the carpet on the floor where your shoes have been brushing this stuff off, uh, that's, that's the result of you know toxic chemicals. And if you can go with a less toxic asphalt sealant, uh, it would be better. So that is me and a couple pictures of, uh, of me at work and at play. <laughs> and. Uh, if I would be happy to take questions now, or if you felt like emailing me direct, you can use my email there, and feel free to contact me. Dan, I am done. OK, well, you're not quite done, Peter, because we have some questions for you. Uh, we also have some questions for uh, Steve DeBusk. Um, and <clears throat> before I... Um, before I get to the questions, I just wanted to say something to the audience that session four uh, which is two weeks from today, has some terrific speakers on energy management systems for the guest room and function rooms, green procurements, and then a, a green hotel case study of the wonderfully innovative Sabre Point Inn and Spa in Connecticut. Um, and we'll go for as long as people want to stay on the line to answer questions. Peter, here's a, a question for you. Um, the uh, are the green products regulated? What oversight is provided to enable companies to stamp a product as green? What regulatory oversight is provided to prevent greenwashing of chemicals by companies? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, Green Seal and Eco Logo have the criteria that they use. Uh, when they're evaluating chemicals uh, as to whether or not they are green or not uh, available online. So consumers can then look at what it is that those companies are using as criteria. Uh, are, they, is, are these certification programs regulated? I don't think so. Maybe you know, Dan, but 
my answer for that is I don't know. Uh, but what can a company do to prevent the greenwashing is to go with a third party that is uh, that does have some sort of recognition. Um, but there is some research involved. EcoLogo and GreenTeal are the two most established, uh, and EcoLabel. So maybe those are the three most established. GreenTeal does certify many things besides chemicals. Uh, they, they, they also certify hotels themselves. Uh, they also do like air conditioners or paint and several other different types of products. But um, I don't know that there's a regulating body that really handles certification programs. It isn't designed for environment also a, uh, a good label? A, a green exactly. certification. Well, it's not a certification. It's uh, it's a program that formulators of chemicals can participate in. So it's a participatory program where they release the ingredients to the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA then hands that formulator manufacturer of the chemical back a list of recommendations and chemicals of concern. And then the formulator has to get back to the EPA on what changes were made. It is not a certification program, but it is a partnership. Um, and I know at, at this point, I'm not quite sure how, um, well, I'll just say that it's, it's another program that, that is working with cleaning chemicals and, and, can, and can be uh, effective in, in getting more environmentally powerful products out there. OK, and briefly, I would say, yes, look for certifications. No certification is perfect. And there may be small companies that don't have the money to uh, get certified. But um, uh, green certifications will certainly give you some peace of mind. Uh, sticking with you, Peter, Environmental Working Group, www.ewg.org, has a list of personal care products that hotels often provide. Do you recommend? the personal care products on EWG is uh, if a product is not listed there, you can still determine its toxicity by listing ingredients in order. Um, I, I think perhaps that, that last one is a question. If a product is not listed there, can you still determine its toxicity by looking at the order of, of the ingredients? I suppose it's possible, but I bet you it's pretty unlikely that someone's going to know all the chemicals. So, I mean, it's just a good indicator if they're listing all the chemicals on it that they're not really hiding anything, that they have nothing to hide. But that's not a guarantee. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that further, but it's a good, it's a good start if they're listing all the ingredients. Per personal. I uh, think the Environmental Working Group is, uh, is ter uh, terrific. Um, I do recommend uh, looking at their website. Uh, I think some hotel products won't be listed there, but if they are listed, I think you'll get a very good sense of how toxic they are. Um, what is the best tick killer um, on mice and rodents? And how can we get it to reduce the risk of Lyme disease to guests? This is a serious problem. Well, Peter, any thoughts on that one? That? What was the beginning part of that question? Uh, what is the best tick killer? So is there anything that, that, uh, that hoteliers could use to kill ticks that might come in on mice or rodents? Oh, uh, I don't know. I have to look up that one, and maybe we'll have to have that person get back to us. OK, yeah, I, I don't know that one also. Uh, a note, uh, Walden Pond built a porous asphalt parking lot. And if anybody needs the specifications, let me know. And I'll send them to uh, Karen Carmian uh, in Cambridge, Mass, who has them. Um, let's see. Wow, we've got a lot of questions. We won't be able to answer all of them. Um, let's see. What can be used? to get rid of ladybugs. We live in northern Minnesota. Oh. Um, that's a great integrated pest management question. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I would suspect that a um, if, if you uh, looked under Green Shield or Green Pro uh, certified pest controlling companies and asked them, they may be able to uh, they may be able to fight ladybugs with another sort of uh, bug. I know that some hotels in Maine actually bring bugs in to uh, go after certain pests rather than use chemicals. But with regard to ladybugs in Minnesota, I have no idea. OK. Before we uh, continue with um, uh, toxics questions, 
Um, I want to ask two questions uh, back for uh, window film. And um, Steve DeBusk, are you still with us? And are you unmuted? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, first question, I just want to confirm that ammonia-based cleaners will not harm the film. Well, that it uh, depended on the manufacturer, so you need to check with each manufacturer. I know that uh, the it, it depended on the adhesive that holds the film on the glass. Mm -hmm. so I know my company, we, we, uh, we're okay with ammonia-based cleaners, but there are some companies that do not recommend that. Okay. And can the film be incorporated into the glass to eliminate the process of adding it later? Would this be more cost effective? There are, uh, there's one manufacturer called Southwall that actually has the, uh, the brand of heat mirror film that goes between the panes of glass. And you can look into that. Uh, actually, the Empire State Building used that method. They actually had insulated glass windows Instead of adding the film directly to the glass, they actually took the glass apart, added the suspended film, and then put the glass back together. So there are there are uh, two ways of doing that. I don't I don't think many people actually add the suspended film after the fact. It's usually a OEM product. Okay, okay. Uh, Peter Cook, back to you. A guest from Singapore and water management told us that chlorine is forbidden there. How do they prevent mold and mildew? Is this, like, is this a swimming pool question or a cleaning a cleaning question? I believe it's a, a, a cleaning disinfectant question. Okay. Uh, so instead so of chlorine. using bleach, the, the, so they can't use uh, chlorine bleach apparently in Singapore. I, I think this is the question. How do they prevent mold and mildew? Uh, yeah, well, they might be using uh, something else like, like I mentioned. There are some alternatives to just chlorinated um, uh, you know, chlorinated disinfectants. So silver ionization or hydrogen peroxide uh, could be used, maybe one of those two options, or uh, potentially a, a, even one of those salt saline solutions. OK. Uh, a question, the greatest disinfectants, and uh, I think would be uh, vinegar. Uh, what do you think about that? I don't know how well vinegar disinfects. Um, you know, I mean, what you're looking at when you disinfect is you're looking to kill stuff. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, I mean, the, you know, the reason why um, they work so well is because it's toxic. I mean, that's why that's how stuff dies. Uh, so when you're disinfecting a surface, you're basically bringing a toxic substance to that surface to kill stuff on there. So, uh, you know, if you use chlorine disinfectant, just use it sparingly and only on the spots that you need rather than doing the walls all around the toilet and you know, then the floor every single day. Um, yeah, I once asked this of the, the head of seventh generation and he um, <laughs> gave me his biased opinion and he said it, it's, uh, you know, may be effective at home but in, in commercial facilities it might not be good enough. Um, well, it also opens you up to a legal liability if you're not using something that you know the state <laughs> requires so uh, you know but you can use hydrogen peroxide based disinfectants as well I mean some say that that's not as toxic or alcohol rubbing alcohol <laughs> okay two more comments to wrap up um, one is the EPA has a good guide on personal care products at www.epa.gov slash region 9 slash healthy dash hair product hair slash products dot html uh, once again www.epa.gov slash region 9 slash healthy dash hair slash products dot html and the EPA website mentions the Environmental Working Group and also Good Guide. So I assume then that the Environmental Working Group and Good Guide are two um, useful websites for, uh, for cleaning products. Well, um, thank you everybody for this presentation. Feel free to contact me with your comments or questions. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Uh, for any of the other speakers, um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Well, thanks for okay, having me. Okay, well, uh, thank you, everybody. See you in two weeks. Bye.